During his short life, Malcolm X was a controversial figure, vilified by whites who saw his fierce black nationalism as a threat to national security and criticized by black civil rights leaders for his failure to embrace the goal of racial integration. Since his assassination in 1965, however, he has come to be regarded as a hero in the fight for the human rights of black people worldwide. How did he evolve from street hustler to a black icon venerated by the likes of President Barack Obama? And what was his main contribution to the lives of black folks? Les Payne, the late Pulitzer Prize winning Newsday reporter and editor, and his daughter, Tamara Payne, try to answer those questions in The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X, winner of the National Book Award for Nonfiction. Welcome. Hello, Cheryl, thank you. Tamara, your father worked on this biography of Malcolm X for about 30 years, I believe. Why was it so important for him to, to write this book? Uh, my father and I worked on this together. He brought me on as a researcher in, back in 1991. And he was not at the time, before 1990, I would say that he didn't want to write a biography of Malcolm X. He didn't feel that one was needed. He admired Malcolm and he had read Malcolm's autobiography and listened to his speeches. And he felt that having the speeches and the autobiography was all that we really needed. We had everything we needed to know about Malcolm. But dad being the consummate reporter and always looking for a new story, he happened to meet uh, one of the Malcolm's brothers in Detroit through a childhood friend of his, Walter L. Evans. And through that meeting, he had an interview with, with this brother and he learned so many things about Malcolm's childhood and his upbringing and his family. Um, it mesmerized dad and he just said, you know, we don't know this. And when he came back to New York, he spoke with his uh, colleague, Gil Noble, who hosted a Like It, like it Is, uh, important show here in, in New York, in New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, and Gil Noble, who also was an uh, admirer of Malcolm, said, you know, which brother did you speak to? So dad has spoken with Philbert, who was two years older than Malcolm, and, and Gil Noble had explained to my father that he should speak with Wilfred. So dad determined to find out more about this story, went back to Detroit and spoke with Wilfred and interviewed him. Um, for eight hours. So a total, of just those two initial interviews were a total 16 hours. Um, and it was rich with details about their upbringing, their family, young Malcolm. Um, we also received, you know, we're getting the story from Wilfred, for example, about what it was like when the Klan visited the family when Malcolm wasn't even born yet. His mother was, um, Louise Little was pregnant with Malcolm and they were visited upon by the Klan local Klansmen in Omaha, Nebraska in 1925. And Wilfred gives us incredible details of what that was like, his talking about the horses, hoofbeats coming onto their property and, and he liking horses at that time. Um, but then also seeing that his mother was angry and, and, and had to stand her ground. And so therefore he was also upset because his mother was upset. Um, so this is, you know, these kind of details we don't, we never had heard before. And dad realized that there's, some, there's much more to learn about Malcolm and who this man was. But more importantly, not just who Malcolm was, but the world he was born into. And so when we look at The Dead or Arise, we open the book with that scene in Omaha, Nebraska, which happened a few years after the uh, 1919 incident of Omaha, where Will Brown was lynched uh, for supposedly raping a white woman, which he did not, and it was found that he did not. Uh, because she had made up the story. But anyway, in 1919, uh, he was lynched and it was so incredible because the whole town was almost was involved. It was a mob scene and they wanted to, you know, get this black man who raped this, this young white woman in front of her boyfriend. And uh, they wanted, they fiercely wanted to find this person and they, they found Will Brown who actually had rheumatoid arthritis and had difficulty moving around. But that he was going to be the man that they made an example of. And he was arrested. The mayor of, of Omaha wanted to have him have a trial. So have a fair trial to see if he was guilty. And the mob did not want that. They wanted to seek justice for themselves. And anybody who got in their way, I mean, they had burned down their, their state office, their city office building. They hung the mayor 
uh, the mayor did survive his uh, injuries from that. And the result of that night was they killed Will Brown. They hung him. They shot his body up after he was dead from the hanging. And then they took his body, tied it to the back of a car, dragged it through the streets of Omaha. And then at the end of the, all of this, burned him, uh, burned his body, took pictures and sold pieces of the rope from the lynching, you know, for as memorabilia for people. So this horrendous incident that happened in 1919, they were still feeling, this town still feeling reverberations when the Little family moved there. And, and they moved there in the early 20s. That's how we open up the, bu the book so that people understand this is the world that Malcolm was born into. And these things, these incidents, they impact Malcolm and, and the decisions that he made, as well as other members of his family, his parents. So, so the um, lynching, that's the just impact, the opening. Yeah. Right. The impact of the lynching was, was, was one thing that had not been included in previous um, books about Malcolm X. What were some of the other things that you discovered or that we discovered in this book that had not been revealed before? Well, we really go into more details of what Malcolm was, what he was like as a child and how his parents, for example, in, um, taught the Marcus Garvey teachings and imbued their children with a sense of pride of being Black people. Um, so that we understand that Malcolm's sense of who he was as a Black person didn't come from the nation of Islam. It actually came from his parents, his childhood. And that not only Malcolm had it, his brothers had it. And what we learn even in more detail is how Wilfred joined the nation of Islam and brought all the family into, the, into that organization. And he joined it mainly because of the similar philosophies that they had in, in building and supporting their community. It wasn't so much for Wilfred, the religion so much, but Malcolm also became in, um, indoctrinated with the religion and believed in the religion and then even pursued it further to become a Sunni, Sunni Islam, to join Sunni Islam, an Orthodox Muslim. So um, we learn more in details about these things. Mal what we also learned from Wilfred is that he was Malcolm's oldest brother, but he was also Malcolm's confidant. So hearing these stories from him is really interesting to understand that Malcolm confided in his brother during good times and bad times throughout his, his life till the day he died. Um, other things that we learn about Malcolm, you know, we learned about Mal Earl Little's uh, death and the impact that had on Malcolm and the, fam and the rest of the family, but particularly on Malcolm and how he carried to the, his dying days that in his part, he believed that he, his father was killed by, by the clans Klansmen in Lansing whereas his father actually died in a streetcar accident when he slipped and fell on, on the tracks. And finding that information was, you know, to set that straight and understand. The other siblings, for example, understood that and they accepted that. Wilfred was there when the police came and told his mother, um, you know, that an accident happened to go identify and see um, Earl Little, hopefully before the, he died, but he had passed away before they got there. Before but, she but Malcolm died. always harbored this sense of outrage that it was the uh, the white people who had who had and it was something he just death. made out of out of the blue by the way because their family was living on property for example that had an exclusionary clause that said that black people couldn't own the land and the white neighbors of Lansing did not want the little family on that land and they moved to to evac to um, have them evicted from the property and so. When they were evicted um, by court proceedings, and then somebody burned down their house, so there was tensions already there. There were people who said that they were part of the Black Legion and said that they want they took responsibility for the killing of Earl Little, even though it was found that he was not killed, you know, by a lynching, but he was in a streetcar accident. Right. So these things are things that came out of the blue for Malcolm. They understood how their father died, and they also said that. They understood that Malcolm accepted that, but they said that that was not what right. had happened. One thing I found really interesting about the book is that it periodically, it returns to the impact that skin color had on the relationships between black people. Um, Malcolm's father, I guess from time to time, who was dark skinned, um, sometimes resented his wife's light skin, although m maybe that was one of the reasons he had married her in the first place. Uh, the book says that his father also may have favored Malcolm over his other children because of Malcolm's lighter complexion. And it also points out that 
many of the early civil rights leaders were fair skinned, whether you're talking about W.B. Du Bois, certainly Adam Clayton Powell, Walter White of the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall, um, and that Marcus Garvey, who was very dark skinned, was often ridiculed by mid middle class um, black people. Um, so that color thing that has really influenced relationships and sometimes distorted relationships between blacks, um, but people don't talk about it much. Uh, often it's, you know, the sort of the elephant in the room, but it was interesting that the, that the, the book brought that out. Throughout Malcolm's life, he seemed to swing back and forth between extremes. You know, he got into trouble as an adolescent after his father died and, and was sent off to a, a foster home in Mason, Michigan, uh, where he went to a largely white school and became and then became a star student uh, and a star athlete and was very popular among black and white students. Then he leaves there and he goes to live with his half sister in Boston, where he turns into, I mean, I can only say it, an all out hoodlum, you know, between Boston and New York, uh, gets involved in so many um, illegal things. And then there's the outlandish hair, there's the outrageous dress, uh, there's the, the, the string of women. And then he, he, he finally gets involved with the crime ring that sends him to prison. And then there he becomes, he becomes, goes under uh, a, a dramatic transformation, you know, and becomes this very devout, very disciplined uh, Muslim. You know, I just found this switching back and forth very, especially uh, the conversion of this young, you know, hip, uh, street talking, really hoodlum into a very disciplined um, uh, member of the nation of Islam. Was there a, a particular turning point where he flipped and became a just totally different person? No, I think that what we're able to do with this book is put in context the journey that Malcolm takes. Um, as I, we started with in discussing about Mal, the, uh, Malcolm's father's death, for example, his father's uh, death, because we say that Malcolm was close to his father, his father used to take him to the UNIA meetings he used to lead. Um, that death, that missing that his father figure, you know, was an important void in his life and not having that person there. And I also like to say that I wouldn't say so much that Earl's anger with Louise wasn't was about color. It was more about her education because he was less educated than she was than she. And you know, and she spoke different language. You know, she spoke French. She sang to her children in French. She was a grammarian. She you know hammered that into. So she was really into her kids' schoolwork. And this education was really an issue. And this is what was brought out in a lot of the conversations from Philbert and Wilfred. Um, so I wouldn't say it was more. It was him angry at her for the color, but definitely education may have been an issue. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that we put him more in context. When you have this father figure who's missing from him, who was such a, you know, a leader, you know, an, an impact and, and, and figure in his life is now gone and that's missing. And you kind of sense Malcolm kind of, you know, and also he's, when he, and when he starts getting into trouble, he's, he's about 12 years old. And he's individuating. He's a teenager, and this is, you know, teenagers kind of sometimes they get in trouble. They get, they go on drugs. They do, they try things that they shouldn't do. We don't want them to, whether they have both parents in their lives or not. And the other things we put in context that other people, what, where does this time? This is during the Great Depression, and everybody is struggling, trying to make ends meet. So there are, again, it's putting the context of the world that Malcolm was in and his trip. Yes, there are people who didn't go that route, but then there are people who did because of where they were in their emotional state, particularly Malcolm. We try to give you a little insight into what that was like for him and what it meant to him and his journey. And so when you see it, so it's not, I don't see it as swings. I can see him going in this trajectory when you see the context and his personality of what he's going through. And, and it's an interesting journey in that sense. The other thing about the crime ring, you know, I would say that when I was in college and this autobiography was taught, 
you know, in college at my school, um, when they were talking about him being a criminal, I mean, it was always kind of presented to as if he was 25 years old, a full grown adult, when he was really late teens, 17 and 18, which is a very different mindset. You're not even fully developed in your mind at that point. So again, times, what it, and also at that time, when, every, when he's, he's not the only one who's hustling, I mean, in Harlem, everybody is hustling. We give you other examples of people, for example, Red Fox. He understood what Malcolm was doing, but also Red Fox was an entertainer honing his skills to be a comedian. Um, John Sanford, he's known as in the book. So there's a, there's a, it's whatever, what the context of those times were and what people were doing to make ends meet and how they were trying to make ends meet. And so um, it's and, and understanding and, and how does this impact everybody? You know, I mean, and everybody, and, and when you put in the context like that, and sure, for me, what's important is that when people come away from the story is that when hopefully we'll look to the stories of their elders and their own families going through those times, they will find that there are similar stories that they have relatives who are doing similar things. During his lifetime, as I said early, Malcolm was, he was really vilified by, by a large portion of white society. Uh, you know, threatened by his denunciation of uh, blue-eyed white devils um, and his call for Blacks to separate themselves from white society. And he was never accepted, I remember how he was never accepted by a large portion of certainly middle-class Black society, which had thrown its support behind uh, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Yet, only almost 30 years after his death, he's really revered uh, as a seminal figure in the struggle for human rights for Blacks. What do you think caused this shift in, in perception of him? Malcolm, well, Malcolm speaks about oppression. He speaks to oppression and he speaks on both sides of oppression. When we're talking about Malcolm, when he's talking about blue-eyed devils, um, that's in the nation of Islam. And that is the language that is being used at the time to talk about the evils of what the nation of what white people were doing and white supremacy was doing it in this country and still is. But at the time, if you think about Elijah Muhammad, his family leaving the South because of lynchings, a lot of these families we, we talk about in this book where people are moving, and this is what the great migration was, the people are moving out of the Jim Crow South from better opportunities in the North, met with other forms of, of white supremacy and where they could live and where they could work and how much money they can earn and the opportunities that were available to them. And so um, Malcolm very much during his lifetime spoke about this and he spoke about how it affected us on our side of, of the uh, oppression in this, uh, and of white supremacy as well as what white people were doing to us. But he was also saying we have a way to stand up and that was coming from his upbringing through Marcus Garvey, which also was you know, trailed in through the Nation of Islam. But I also would like to say there is a, and I, just this last thing on this is that, you know, Martin Luther King had this quote and he said that uh, segregation imbues a segregator with a false sense of superiority and the segregated, meaning black people and the oppressed, a false sense of inferiority. And Martin Luther King and, and the civil rights groups that, as you're saying, the middle class black people were fall, falling behind them they were dealing with the false sense of superiority of the white suppressors, of white supremacy, changing the laws, desegregating buses, desegregating lunch counters, desegregating jobs, Voters Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These are all important, 1965, these are all important legislations that uh, helped change our lives. And that's what they were focusing on. And Malcolm, through the Nation of Islam, was also looking at that, but because the nation and what Elijah Muhammad was preaching was separate state, meaning that they didn't want integration. They didn't want to integrate with white people, white society, because he said, look, we'll, have, we'll take our chances with ourselves. They were dealing with the false sense of inferiority of black people. And basically and said, black people, you're not inferior. <laughs> you're not inferior. You're and, not inferior and you should yeah. embrace who you are. Right. The shape of your nose, your lips, the texture of your hair. Malcolm has a speech where he says, who taught you to hate yourself? One of the really new things I, I learned from the book was this meeting, this attempt, um, well, it was uh, Elijah Muhammad instructed Malcolm to do it, but to try to engage with the Ku Klux Klan of all groups, to 
to, and there was an actual meeting between Malcolm and the head of the Atlanta temple with high ranking members of the Klan. What was that about? Well, it was in 1961. Malcolm was actually visiting in, in Georgia. This is the Georgia temple, which was who uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah X at the time, but also later known as Jeremiah Shabazz was the minister. But they received a telegram from the local Klansmen and basically saying that they would like to meet. Malcolm reading this, you know, he's excited because he sees this really as an opportunity for the nation of Islam to kind of face off with the Klan and tell them where to go. Uh, he wants, he doesn't want to have any kind of alliance with the Klan or anything like that. But be, as you know, we need to understand is that Malcolm nor Jeremiah are the leaders of the uh, nation of Islam. So they have to go back to Chicago and speak with Elijah Muhammad and he does direct them basically to meet with them, to see what they want, but to curry what their interests were, his interests were for the nation of Islam, which was to build up more temples in the South, acquire land, have their own farms and build up their businesses. Um, they wanted to grow their own food and, and their cattle and, and so on and so forth. So that's what he would, he wanted to acquire land for those reasons. And he was like, maybe the clan can help us. And if they can't, maybe they can stay out of our way, you know, don't harass our members while they're doing their business since they, res you know, respect us so much that they want to have a meeting. But if you read the book in that chapter, I mean, what, what that, that the meeting happened is not really news. We always, I mean, Malcolm spoke about this a week before you died. Um, and we've known about that meeting happening. We did not know the actual details of the meetings because we were able to um, get that from Jeremiah Shabazz. And this again is, is what was great about this book because, you know, my father never described himself as a scholar or a historian. He described himself as a journalist. And again, what's new, what's important and what is not easily found out. It is a journalist's job. I mean, and you know this, Cheryl, I mean, working with, working at Newsday, I mean, journalists are supposed to find out what happened. They're the right, first right. tellers of what's happening in, in history. And we can see that even now with what's going on, what happened two weeks ago at the Capitol with one a thing, journalist one, telling that story. One thing I have learned in only recent years is that two of the, uh, two of the three men who were convicted uh, for Malcolm X's murder were innocent. We're not even at the um, the hall, uh, the ballroom on the day that Malcolm was shot, and mm -hmm. that um, two of the men, uh, who are William Bradley and Leon Davis, who were actually w among the shooters, were never charged and convicted. Are any of the uh, three assassins still alive and walking around? Well, that shows a team of five assassins um i believe i don't know that all of them are dead most of them are dead and uh i believe one may still be alive but you know he is older now um and i do understand that uh norman butler is still alive thomas johnson who did serve time for the murder and he was not there has passed he's passed away and it's unfortunate because the person who really you know who was on the shotgun um which is what we know to have been the injuries that killed Malcolm, he died. He's never served a day in jail for this murder. And was, you think one of the reasons that they didn't follow through on who killed him was that the law establishment, certainly the FBI, the police were happy to have Malcolm dead, didn't really want to find out who his killers were? We show similarly to that. I mean, we understand that Malcolm was Followed. We understand that his group, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, was infiltrated, as was the other organization, which had not been fully formed. But uh, there was, you know, a police informant on his security detail, and uh, Gene Roberts, who we spoke to and told us his story of working on there and how he got into into that assignment. Um, yeah, he was there, and and he was he was writing reports and telling, you know, his superiors at Bossy. Bureau of Special Services Investigation, you know, what was going on in that he also believed that Malcolm was going, to, when Malcolm was going to be murdered. And that's when they fell apart, fell back. They lessened their detail, but yet they had informants. They, we found at least, we had two of them, there were more in the room who were reporting that Malcolm was killed to their supervisors. So um, that's found. Um, and honestly, you know, 
the way my, the work that was put into uh, writing that those chapters, I think really those chapters need to be read by everybody who has questions about the assassination and just kind of talking about this and mentioning who's alive and who's that really diminishes the work um, because the details that are in there um, and in the chronology of, of it really should be looked at and, and people should read the book. Yeah, and I yeah. encourage the people to read the book for that reason. What do you want? We have about two minutes left. What do you want readers to take away from the book? I mean, here's an opportunity to look at who one of the most interesting figures, American figures of the 20th century, who people are still picking up to this day all over the world. Um, and, and you may have questions as to why. You know, but let's find out who he is and also what world shaped him, you know, what world events shaped him and, and how they shaped him. And then to understand that we present a much more nuanced uh, portrait of Malcolm and it's important to see him in, in these lights, to understand that there are things that he went through that many of us have gone through. Um, and if not us in our generation prior to us. And I hope encourage that people also think about the history because in this book, we also talk about what happened even a hundred years ago, which even, and, and things that happened even before, but particularly a hundred years ago that are still happening, you know? And, and if you want to know how we got to where we are today, where you see an insurrection against the Capitol, you know, and, and people with the misinformation about who won an election, a presidential election, Malcolm kind of talks about a lot of that during his life, but we show you how in history, how this build up and not fully dealing with these, these incidences these, this energy has led to where we are today. And so people may wonder, well, how did this happen? How did, where did it happen? We, we do lay out and we show people that there are other places where you can get information on, on, on how we got there. Because what's important, I think what's important about understanding how we got here today is so that we don't continue making these mistakes. We're going to make mistakes, but let's make new ones. Not, let's not repeat the old ones. Well, those of us who worked with your father and heard about the book being written over the years, I am just really thrilled. It was very, very uh, well-written and interesting book. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that it came out and is going to serve as part of your father's very uh, powerful legacy. So thank you for that. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'd like to thank Tamara Payne, the co-author with her late father, Les Payne, of The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X, published by Liberate Publishing. To learn about our upcoming shows, be sure to follow us on Twitter at one to one CUNY TV. For the City University of New York and one to one I'm Cheryl McCarthy.